Hi there, I'm Ari Gross from College Street Comics. You can find me online at www.arigross.ca, A-R-I-G-R-O-S-S.ca. My Instagram is college underscore ST underscore comics. I'm on Twitter at Ari B. Gross, and you are watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a returning guest. He was on the show last year talking about his amazing comic sci-fi series called Awakening. He is back with an amazing comic series called Wardens. We're joined by the ever-talented Ari Gross. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you doing? Doing good, doing good. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. I've got a, tons of different weird life experiences sort of thing. Tend to be a, an academic for a while. I did way more school than is probably uh, certainly financially advisable. These days, I've been totally repositioned my life in terms of like finding a nine to five software development thing, coding. Apparently, I'm not terrible at that. So that's kind of fun. That was one side of things I need, but I needed something else, something creative, which is making comics. I, I love comics. As you can see from behind me, I've got a bunch of them. I have two kids and their rooms are just like the old with comics is kind of like ridiculous and obscene. I've loved comics ever since I was a kid. I've always wanted to write a comic, but I didn't really have a good story for a while. And then I just had a story that sort of sat in the back of my mind for years. Okay, if you don't do it now, when are you going to do it? Pandemic was on. I've got time, no one to stop me but myself. So I decided to start writing the story and the story was warded. Initially a six issue series. These are double issues. So 44 pages, so like 264 pages. I wrote the whole script. I'd never done any creative writing in the past. So this is a whole new experience for me after i wrote it i wrote like the the draft for wardens i looked around asked people like hey what do i do how do i turn this into a comic and they all said the same thing you can't turn a 264 page script into a comic if you've never made a comic before do something small something reasonable do a four page or a six page or a one pager so i did that i wrote a comic for tales of the cloakroom which was a, a six pager. I wrote a few other shorts for some other anthologies, Fairy Tales from Mars, uh, Might, Magic, and Monster in Laws. I eventually did a single issue uh, Awakening. I figure I want to understand the Kickstarter process, understand what it means to make a comic, soup to nuts, top to bottom, publish the whole thing, complete self-published, to understand how it is. And then after all that, I was like, okay, now it's time to do Wardens. Now it's time to tell the story that I've wanted to tell from the absolute beginning. I am extremely thrilled for this Kickstarter because this is the thing I've been working on since 2018, I would say. Like it's finally coming to fruition. I mean, this is just issue one, of course. But I've got a finished thing ready for issue two and my artist is going to start working on that pretty much the moment this campaign is done. So we're going with this. It's actually happened. Super excited about it. I can tell. Yeah, no, it, you can hear it in your voice. What is Wardens all about? Yeah, absolutely. Wardens takes place in 1926 in an area of Toronto called The Ward, or St. John's Ward, but people called it The Ward. Essentially a poor immigrant neighborhood. The area that I'm dealing with is early 20th century with a lot more immigration. The history of Toronto and immigration is a whole thing I'm not going to go into right now, but suffice to say, around the year 1900, a bit before, you have large waves of immigration from Europe, largely Jews, Italians, Southern Europe and Northern Europe. A lot of those people didn't live in the ward because the ward was the poor slum neighborhood. For the point of the comic, the main ethnic groups I'm focusing on are Eastern European Jews, uh, which is actually a bit of a different group than the Jewish people immigrated to Toronto before, which were largely sort of Germanic and much more integrated, cosmopolitan, much more secular. This has a lot of Jews from, at the time, was Imperial Russia, the Russian Empire. So like Vilna, which is Vilnius, Lithuania, Poland, Russia, various places that Russia either conquered or thinks it still wants to conquer. There's a whole thing about that. But it's a different kind of group of people that came. You have a Chinese population in the ward. Of course, there's a large immigration to Canada. The Chinese people that took place in the uh, early 20th century before essentially Chinese people were banned from coming to Canada for a good 30 years. I forget the exact dates. There's a head tax instituted, and then there's the Chinese Exclusion Act, or I can't remember if it was called that or something slightly different in Canada. Uh, so this takes place after that, where there is a, a large number of Chinese immigrants, but they're mostly men because people didn't want families coming. They just wanted laborers. You know, it's essentially the idea was sort of have almost like an itinerant worker sort of thing. But of course, that's not how most immigration works. People come to a place, it's different than they had at home. It's better. It's safe. 20th century 
China is a bit of a disaster. China had a really rough history for the first bit of the 20th century. So a lot of people here are quite happy to not be there. There's a black community that exists in the wards going back to the mid 19th century. I'm not sure. At the time I'm writing the 20s are descendants of escaped slaves, people who came through the Underground Railroad Network to Canada. And there was even a couple people, at least one in particular, that a black man, I guess, that uh, bought a bunch of properties and created a small community of a place where black people could live in the ward. It's an interesting sort of like little melting pot where you have these various communities that are kind of coming together. And the story I want to tell is one that focuses a bit on the communities themselves and the, their own contexts, how they have to eventually come together to deal with these sort of supernatural threats, with these uh, social issues. Uh, there's a lot of labor stuff. There's a whole tension between like the boss and the union in this, which starts here, but it's really picks up in the later issues. And then of the main reason why everyone's got to come together is to deal with this threat of the shmata. Uh, the shmata, uh, for those of you who don't know, shmata is a Yiddish word, which means rag. The shmata business was, it's what most Jews or Ashkenazi Jews call the garment industry or a major source of uh, employment for Jews in North America and in Europe, but especially immigrant Jews. My family used to work in the shmata business and my father's side, my grandfather did, my great grandfather did. Like, so I'm writing something that's kind of close to home. They weren't in Toronto, they were in Montreal, but the same basic idea, people come over, they need to do something. Tailoring is a very transportable skill and it just becomes sort of part of the culture. The Shmata itself is a, a series of, uh, or an assemblage of possessed clothes. It's blessed by uh, this Kabbalistic magic that this tailor has been creating. Without giving too much away, at the end of the issue, you have the rise of this angry series of clothes that is looking for revenge on the people who started the fire and other people. And it's not just one person in it, it's a multitude of souls that get sucked into this thing. I wanted a villain that's, I mean, the Shmata itself is inspired by, I think, Venom, amongst other villains. Mm -hmm. Villains that are wees, villains that are collectives, like the sort of Legion idea, which I like. Sometimes they get pulled in different directions. The only thing holding them together is the people who died in this tragedy have in common, which is their lingering anger and their desire for revenge and justice from their perspective. That's the supernatural sort of element, or one of them. There's going to be a few more that come in in future issues, and they all sort of get mesh together to make this interesting story that's grounded in one way. People just trying to get through their lives, working 11-hour days where they're really not getting paid anything, and how do you even save money or afford a house or whatever based on that, and then all this other crazy supernatural stuff. So I want Wardens to sort of have those two pillars to stand on. A little bit of grounded, a little bit of supernatural, hopefully a lot of fun. Who's the team around Wardens? With yourself as the writer, who else did you bring on for this amazing project? Wardens is a two to three hander, depending how you look. It's me doing the writing and I'm also doing the lettering because I'm insane and want to <laughs> adjust to dialogue up until the last second. <laughs> the way that people talk in diction is extremely important for Wardens. So that's something that I work on much more than other projects, uh, I would say, in terms of getting people to sound like they're saying the right thing the right way. The main guy is Rob Jennix. He's out of New Waterford, uh, Nova Scotia, which is Cape Breton. It's right outside of Sydney. Mm -hmm. For those of you who don't know Canada, imagine you're going east and then like keep going east and basically go east until you hit the water. Like that's where he lives. He lives very far east. Not close to Toronto, like at all. Rob Jennix is great. I initially put out a call for artists for Wardens on seven different platforms, social media, websites. He was the only one whose work I liked. And it worked. I gave him uh, some specifications for Rachel, the main character. He sent me a thing. I said, well, I described it wrong. How about this? And then his second thing was perfect. There were like no changes. And I was like, okay, clearly he's on like the same way. Like, we're completely on the same page. He knows what's up. And his style is perfect for this. It's got the cartooniness, the sort of energy I want out of this. He's great. And my editor, Aubrey Lynn Jepson, who was the editor for Tales from the Cloakroom, along with uh, C.K. Lawson. Yeah. Uh, she was also the editor I had for Awakening. I've been working with her for a while. She's basically my my voice of reason. Certainly the person who's like, this is a crazy thing to put in this book. Do not put this in this book. And I was like, okay, that makes lots of sense. Or this is crazy and good. Definitely keep this in the book. We've been working together pretty closely for the past few years on various comic projects. She's pretty much been my only editor. And I really like her as an editor. She's great. She's also great as a person, just a general champion of me and other people's work. It's a small team, but it's a good team. Like everyone on there is good at what they do and they are right person for this particular project. Small but mighty. <laughs> exactly. That's all you need. I'm doing it all myself pretty much. So, you know, like getting the book together and everything. I like a very hands-on approach, especially because it has a very particular feel. It's not your sort of general comic. The back matter is very specific. There's four pages of stuff in the back of the book. Two pages is just an essay 
me explaining why I'm writing the story that I'm writing, which isn't the kind of stuff that I think you can really get in a comic if I were writing for somebody else. So, so Ari, what does your morning routine look like, especially considering your diverse background and experiences? So I am not a morning person. Uh, I do have to get up for work. I've got a nine to five, which is great after having years of been unemployed and uh, wondering what the hell I'm going to do with my life. Having a job is actually nice. Uh, having a job you like is even better. But I am not a morning person. I mean, I got out of bed today at 11 o'clock. I would have slept in longer if I could have, but I had to make kids lunch. I do my stuff at night. I write at night. I mean, I'm thinking about it continuously. I'm very protective of my time. That tends to be at night. That's always how I've been. I'm just always a night person. Who are three people, whether alive or historical, that have had the most significant impact on your writing style and storytelling? Interesting question. I'll talk specifically about wardens because I think different stories draw from different people as influences. Right now, the other comic I'm working on is called Upkeep, and it's sort of a family drama horror. And people, I guess, I feel inspired by when I write that are very different than Wardens, which is a supernatural action comedy. So for Wardens, uh, some of the people that I've been drawing on a lot are, here's the big one, Will Eisner. I mean, if you're going to draw on somebody, draw on like this guy's work, the spirit, uh, contract with God. The Wardens has a lot of sort of the spirit energetic feel. If you read some of the old spirits, they're fun. They're like the kind of book that you would want to just sort of continue reading because the characters are engaging and it's like there's the plot moving forward, but it's not just about that. It's really just about the characters. And A Contract for God, I mean, I can't understate how important this is. Comics in general, for Jewish comics specifically, A Contract for God has what I believe is the most succinct encapsulation of Jewish thought. If anyone doesn't know A Contract for God, I'll just give you a primer. This is from the 70s. It is arguably uh, the first graphic novel, really laying down new ground here. The story focuses on, on a man, a religious Jewish man, whose uh, daughter died, and he is destroyed. He is like, this is garbage. I've done everything I can for God, and God has done nothing for me. So he turns his back on Judaism, turns his back on the faith, becomes very successful, becomes sort of a well-to-do businessman, very secular, but realizes there's still something missing in his life. So then he goes to these, uh, these rabbis, these scholars, and he wants to have a contract with God, a new contract. Previously had a contract, but it was broken, he felt, by God. So he wants something new. And there's this line, is not all religion, a contract between man and God, which is like Judaism in a nutshell. That's what it is. It's the idea that you do something, someone then looks after you, and it's a contractual obligation rather than an obligation out of, it's not like Christianity, it's not like Islam, it's not like other religions that are more faith-based, there's an element of faith, but it's about following the rules, which is something that has massively influenced how I write Wardens, eventually if we get to all the Jewish magical stuff. It's about following the rules, it's about like almost like coding, doing things in a way that if you do this, you will get this result. And it's not about blind faith, which is different, I feel, than a lot of other people's take on religion. If anyone hasn't read this, you don't need to read the other stories, although they are also great. This whole book, this Dropsy Avenue sort of trilogy, talks about, it's a little layered, it's in the 30s mostly, but it's the same kind of thing. It's like mostly poor people living in a poor neighborhood trying to navigate their life. You know, the stories are small in nature. They're very personal. And that's something I wanted to do in Wardens. I don't want this to be a world-ending story. By issue six, the culmination of this story, with all the plots coming together and big fights is going to be big stuff. It's not about saving the world because I don't want it to be that big. I want it to be about something that's very personal, very focused, very local. The things matter a lot to these people, but they might not matter to someone who's like, you know, three kilometers out that way. You know, they're just in a different neighborhood. They have different stuff going on, different values, different backgrounds. Yeah, I want to make it as sort of as tight and focused as possible on the characters and the communities. A couple other people who've sort of inspired me as a writer, as a comic writer, I guess. First would be Bill Willingham and Mark Buckingham who did Fables. Jonathan Hickman, who did a bunch of other stuff because of their world building and their ability to create these places that you would want to live in and that have their own rules, their own logic, their own everything, but are different and unique. I mean, uh, the world of Fables, there's a lot going on. It's what if Fables, like story magical fairy tales, you know, were real and they lived in their own little part of New York. But it really gets into the characters that are living there and their relations with each other and like the setting and the place. It's its own thing. And I really admire the way that that Fables does that. And I mentioned Jonathan Hickman just because he's done a bunch of other stuff that's also very world building y while also being sometimes very good character driven stories. East of West, for example, 
is all like cool fantasy world building stuff. And it's a very cool world. It feels very lived in. It's also a history kind of thing. So that's one thing about Wardens. I wanted to focus on this community being its own thing. And even though the world I'm building is geographically small, I want to make it rich. I want to get into the different communities that live there. And that's one thing I like about uh, Fables, for example, is the fact that you'll have some stories that focus on these characters. And then you'll have some folks, stories, uh, stories that focus on these characters and then these characters. They might live next to each other and they might live a little far away from each other, but it's like they're all part of the same community, but they're not the same people. So I really want to uh, drill down into, into that. I guess if I were to mention one other person, Shaul Malechem, the uh, Yiddish writer who wrote the stories that became Fiddler on the Roof. Yeah. Uh, Fiddler on the Roof, uh, I was actually in Fiddler on the Roof in university. I went to Mount Allison University out in Sackville, New Brunswick. I was the only Jewish person in the entire cast of Fiddler, which I thought was kind of amusing. <laughs> it's a great musical. And a lot of the ideas and a lot of the ways people talk, Jewish style comedy, the Yiddish kite, the actual Yiddish in many places, I've just stole a whole bunch of that. There's a scene in the first issue of Wardens where uh, Rachel and the rabbi that she uh, is close with, they're walking through the town and you know they're talking with uh, the milkman and the butcher. Uh, and the milkman and the butcher are different personality types. They don't get along, but they're kind of close. I mean, that's just straight up ripped off like Fiddler on the Roof, where you have the Tevye of the Milkman and Laser Bolt the Butcher, and you know, they're milk and dairyans, so they don't mix, which of course is a sort of a Jewish dietary thing. You have this thing that like everyone gets the cultural reason for it, and then you just like plunk, plop it onto the characters, and it fits. And I was like, that's great. I'm taking it. <laughs> that's already goes. And if you can see where I've lifted from, then all the more power to you. That means that you'll probably have a richer experience of reading it. I mean, everything's stolen from everywhere. Yeah, there is no original stories. <laughs> As a writer juggling various roles between being a family man and being a writer, what tools or techniques do you use to stay focused and maximize your productivity? Well, there's a few things I do. First is I have an insane crushing sense of guilt if I don't work on my projects. Uh, I don't recommend this to anybody, but the sort of neurotic, if I don't do this, then I've let myself down. I feel that. The way that I tend to operate in life is I sort of set goals for myself and I'm very serious about achieving them. And if I don't achieve them, I feel like, oh man, I should be working to achieve them. And, you know, I can change. Sometimes I decide I want to do something else and I, that's okay. But for something like comics, I, I believe in and writing or any sort of creative endeavor, I believe in like regular more than uh, intense bouts. So for example, I write or I do something related to comics nightly. These days it's been less writing and more, you know, making stuff for social media. Working on things regularly, one, two hours a day is way better than just saying, oh, I'm going to do it all Saturday. And you spend six hours doing it and you just get burnt out. It's kind of funny. It's the challenge isn't to stay focused. It's to because I'm constantly thinking of this stuff. It's kind of occupies a permanent large portion of my brain. It's more of a time management thing than anything else. Uh, I am super protective of my time at night. After I put the kids to bed, which is pretty late, my daughter probably falls asleep at like 11 o'clock. We're all night owls in this house. No one goes to bed early. Then I'm like, okay, I need to write and I'm focused on that. And I need to make sure that I do that every day. So it's a lot of time management, understanding that you won't get everything done. But if you get something done, if you edit one page of script, that's one page better than you were before. It might not even be that amazing. It might not be just small things. Maybe you've written a page, you're going to throw it out. You've written a page and you realize at the end of the day, I don't want to do this. Or you're playing around with a, a direction for a character and you decide, no, that's not good. You've asked yourself the question, is this a good thing to do? You've tried it, answered the question, no, it's not. That's progress. That's not just spinning your wheels. That's understanding your characters better and getting deeper into your writing. I don't see any effort, even if it's something that you don't end up using as a bad or a waste. I take a very sort of, I don't know, like Aristotelian approach to life in terms of like, it's less about what you think of yourself and more about what you do. The things you do, that's who you are. That's how I try to live. I want to be a writer. You have to write. You want to be a comic creator, you have to create comics. And if you don't do that, you can tell yourself anything. But if you're not walking the walk, then then you don't got it. How has your Canadian and specifically your Montreal and Toronto upbringing influenced the themes and atmospheres of Wardens? I tend to write very personal stories, not just like it's all about me, but stories that are based on where I live. It's typical sort of write what you know, right? Not a shocker. Someone writes a personal story. Everyone writes personal stories. For me, in terms of the subject matter, the context, uh, like I've tried to draw on a lot of my family history. So my family came to Canada 
on my mother's side in the late 20s and 30s, my father's side, early 20th century. And a lot of the stuff in Wardens in terms of the characters, that's all just like drawing on family history. A lot of the names are just like also from my family. There's someone called Yaakov Hafetz. You know, I'm part Hafetz, much as I am gross, I guess, by anything else. So there's a lot of like digging into the history for the details, but also for the main themes. For example, on my father's side, my great-grandfather came to Montreal from Warsaw, I think, either that or Vilna. He was from one, his wife was from the other. Came from Eastern Europe, got a job making dresses. He became a tailor. Eventually, he opened a factory, had other people make dresses for him. And then my grandfather went into the trade and eventually like closed everything out and changed businesses. Now the times were changing. That time, garment industry, that's just like all taken for this story. There's a lot of interesting uh, labor issues, which you know we'll get into as the story goes along. And you'll see in the first issue, a lot of that is drawing on my past. My grandfather owned a factory and my other grandfather on the mother's side worked at a factory and he was on strike a bunch of the time. He lived in Windsor, at uh, worked at the Ford plant. Yep. They had some some massive strikes in like the 50s and 60s. It's kind of neat. I'm just sort of picking wherever, you know, all these stories that people tell me about, you know, my mom growing up, she was like, your grandfather was home a lot of the time. Her mother had to go and get a job because, you know, they were on strike and she needed support to the, uh, the family. A lot of the cultural Jewish stuff is like totally in here. I didn't even realize how much of American or North American comedy was Jewish until I was older. You're just sort of like, oh, Seinfeld, like, I get it. You know, like Arrested Development, I get it. So my wife, for example, who didn't know anything about Jewish culture, she's a Chinese Canadian from Edmonton. Later, after she met my family, she's like, I now understand Seinfeld. Like, I get Curb Your Enthusiasm. Like, I understand these people, like, in a deep way, because they're just your family. Arrested Development, I can literally map every single person in that show to someone in my family oh. from like it's it's eerie <laughs> not necessarily flattering either <laughs> like those people are kind of all nuts my family is kind of all nuts so this particular sort of style of jewish comedy which is even kind of difficult to explain but you sort of know it if you see it that's kind of what i want to channel a lot in in wardens dealing with these specific historical issues that were in toronto which is not where i'm from but something where i've done a lot of research into there's a great book called The War, a series of essays from the last decade, uh, it's sort of an anthology about people in the ward and various communities there and their struggles. So I've done a bunch of research to try to marry sort of the historical facts of the place I'm interested in telling the story of with the cultural style and the language of some of my other inspirations. It's a lot of just picking from everywhere, cramming it all into the story. Hopefully it'll click with people. The use of Yiddish in Wardens adds a unique touch. How do you balance making it accessible to a broader audience while preserving its cultural authenticity? The style is definitely different in terms of dialogue than a lot of other stuff. A lot of Yiddish in there, a lot of untranslated Yiddish. By the way, that's not a big deal because we all have translators on our persons at all time. Like you just look into your phone. But also I spent a lot of time to try to make sure that anything that wasn't translated was understandable from context. So for example, at one point someone calls someone, uh, they say, you're, they think you're a nafka, which is Yiddish for prostitute. The person responds, well, they might as well think I'm a prostitute all the ass I got to kiss all day or something. So it's it's trying to blend the new words that people might not be as familiar with, because honestly, like, no one these days really speaks Yiddish. It's, I mean, it's been a dying language for like a long time. It's not something I expect anybody to know, but it's something that you can probably learn without even having to do that much work, because I put in the effort to explain what the terms mean without being translator note. This means that context, writing, figure it out. Yeah. Wardens incorporates elements of Jewish magic. How did your cultural background and personal experiences, <laughs> sorry, that just, did you have Jewish magic when you were growing up? Like, was that, yeah, <laughs> did I have Jewish magic? Oh, I'm I, yeah, a longstanding Jewish musician, uh, <laughs> musician, magician, maybe both. So Jewish magic is interesting because there's different communities historically that engage in different spiritual or magical practices within Judaism. The Jewish people are, of course, a diverse people historically who've done various things and lived various places for thousands of years. And so in the places that they live, adopted many of the practices, either the religious or spiritual or magical or folklore, mythical practices of the people around them, while having their own separate culture as well. For example, there's some cross-religious pollination in terms of things like commemorating the dead, uh, tradition in Judaism of lighting a yortzai, 
site or yard site. It's Yiddish for a year, time, time of the year. Candle, commemorate someone who's died. So you light a little candle, you let it burn out, and you light it on the day that they've died, either in the Jewish calendar, if you're observant, or the Western calendar, if you don't care. That initially comes from, I believe, Catholic tradition. I think it's a German Catholic thing, lighting candles to commemorate the dead a year after they died or something like that. So there's lots of cross-cultural pollination, which is always super interesting and the kind of thing that's very difficult to summarize in like a single book. All this is to say that in terms of the magical stuff, different people had different magical practices or different sort of spiritual practices that were based in mysticism at different times. So in the 18th century, you have the rise of uh, Hasidism, which broke off from sort of Orthodox Judaism and then became its own form of orthodoxy. Uh, but a lot of the Hasidism is it's supposed to be very spiritual. It's supposed to be sort of more directly, less about just following the rules and more about like celebrating God in this sort of dynamic fashion. Uh, some stuff which is closely related to Hasidism is Kabbalistic magic. Kabbalah, which is not something that I'm an expert in, pretty esoteric, even by like Jewish standard. It's kind of like the weird people writing their ideas about the structure of the universe and the mind of God and how it's represented in humanity all through these like interconnected domains. I'm probably going to get like taken to task by someone who actually knows something about this because I don't know as much. But I do know what I want to do is I want to incorporate Kabbalistic magic and make that basically the root of the supernatural plot point, basically. You have these people who are Kabbalistic magicians and their style of magic. In this case, it's, it's in clothing. Uh, there's blessings, which are just in Yiddish called, or Hebrew called bruchas. Uh, the idea is that one guy in the story, Yaakov, he wants to make magical clothes. So he wants to sew blessings into the clothes. And he's doing that by using different stitches uh, because you can, you know, translate any letters into uh, essentially a binary using Morse code. You know, different stitches uh, give you different letters, Hebrew letters in this case, which when read together, give it a blessing. So the idea is that you can literally sew in these blessings to God and the clothes will then give you magical powers longer life, resistance to disease. And so this all sort of goes awry later on when all these magical clothes and all the blessings sort of come together. And in a moment of desperation, this guy sets up the conditions that'll cause the clothes to become this sort of supernatural, magically empowered antagonist who's essentially invulnerable because all the clothes have been sewn to be invulnerable. Uh, that's what the blessings are there for. The root for this is I wanted, coming back to a contract with God, the idea that if you sow something with a blessing or you sow something with a magical command, it's a contract. It's, it's saying that I am saying something to God. I am saying something, praising his name or whatever. And because of that, I'm going to receive something. It's this sort of contextual, like everyone follows the rules of magic, which is a lot more akin to coding. I call them the commandments, which is like me just being like, how can I make like magical coding through sewing spiritual things into clothes? Which I think is the idea in Judaism that it's about the contract, it's about the covenant, it's about the sort of give and take, it's about what you do and then, you know, what you will receive or what you should receive because of it, rather than articles of faith. Yeah, I wanted to create a magical style that was culturally Jewish in that sense. I'm not a religious person. I didn't grow up religious. We grew up very culturally Jewish in terms of celebrating holidays and stuff like that. But none of the religious stuff, none of that's like from my childhood or anything like that. A lot of people are, but I'm not. Uh, and in fact, many people in Toronto are, are very secular. Because I'm going back 100 years ago, I wanted something that you had a little more of the religion in it and a little more of the religion in a different way. So it's not just the religion as it is, but it's the religious practices transformed into something that in line with the rest of the story, which is based on, you know, the Shemata business, based on clothes, based on sewing, based on garments. And so it sort of brings together the historical practice of people with the religious extra, you know, uh, what if, you know, you could get powers from this or the supernatural side more than anything else. Given your background as a historical scientific instrument collection curator, how do you balance historical accuracies with the creative liberties necessary for a supernatural crime series set in 1920s? The big issues for me were deciding, because I'm doing historical fiction, is deciding what's in and what's out. So I have a background as a historian and philosopher of science. I did a PhD in the history and philosophy of science and previous degrees in physics and history and philosophy of physics. I take a pretty hard-nosed, rigorous approach to history. 
I like studying things as close to the source as possible. If someone says a thing, check your sources, doesn't matter. A real sort of questioning, critical historian approach. At least that's how I was trained, which is good and bad for writing historical fiction. Because on the one hand, you want everything to be accurate. You want to be like, oh, here's a cool thing that happened. This has to be in the story because it happened. And also it's a part of history. It's required to tell. But not everything is like that. So there's a lot of curation. A lot of deciding just because something's cool, it doesn't have to go in there. A lot of that comes down to the ending. Myself or working with Aubrey, whereas I had these whole subplots that really weren't going anywhere, but were based on some interesting historical stuff. For example, there's a factory that everything is based around in Wardens is called Stones. It is located where the Eaton's, the store exists, but the factory doesn't. Stones provides the stuff for Eaton's. Total different break from history. But that's fine because that's the story I want to tell. Like, I don't want to tell Eaton's. I want to tell a, a different factory with different owners, different conditions. You just have to, like, decide what's in and what's out and then kind of stick to that. Historically, I set this in 1926 because 1926 was during Prohibition in Ontario. One or two years later, the law started to be changed and it gets loosened up a bit, which maybe in future issues or whatever I'll address but right now, I want it to be that they go to a speakeasy, and a speakeasy is like not a place that exists necessarily in like 1935. Liquor is legal in 1935. I mean, you might have a bar, but it's not the same sort of thing. You don't have the same sort of worry about the police shutting you down and then the same rum running side for the crime and everything. So you got to pick and choose. It's tough. I mean, every time I write something that's like not technically historically accurate, like a little part of me is like, what are you doing? But it's got to be like a character based story, the characters' journeys and their interactions with each other is more important than getting all the little details right. And so if you have to change some of the details to have a better character story, then that's okay. As long as you know what you changed. And if someone comes up to you and they're like, actually, I'd be like, yeah, I know. But that just draws people towards commenting and everything like that and boils down to social media promotion. Yeah. If anyone's got different things to say about it, like, come at me, please. Like, more engagement, the better. <laughs> so, your diverse career from a certified nuclear energy worker to a doctor of philosophy is impressive. How have these varied experiences shaped your perspective on life and influenced your storytelling? It all comes together. <laughs> and some places more than others. I mean, I wouldn't say that uh, my experience doing beamline optics uh, necessarily has a huge amount to play in Wardens. Actually, has probably more to do with my current job I'm doing as a software developer. In the summer of 2003, I worked at Triumph, which is a particle accelerator out in Vancouver. I spent a lot of time in just a trailer coding at the time was C and Fortran 77 because the whole thing was built back in the day in the older code architecture. The ability to stare at something that's not working, wonder why it's not working, believe it should be working, and then get it to finally work. That's not something you have to learn through working at like a boring coding job in a trailer, but that's something that does help. So a lot of the skills of like these weird academic, like you just got to like focus and do it, and get down into the details. And there's no way out but through to figure it all out. That kind of focus helps a lot for these kind of stories that are so intricate and that are so historical based. I'm the kind of person who tends to get into something and get into it in a, in a big way. If I'm doing it, I take it seriously. That's basically how I approach this, especially like creative endeavors. I've had this weird academic background where I did like physics, I did philosophy of science and the history of science. I was a curator uh, for the University of Toronto Scientific Instrument Collection, going around and collecting old historic scientific instruments and making sure that people don't throw them out and studying them and putting them online and the collection, which is really run by uh, this guy, Eric Weidenhammer. That's, uh, you can go to their website, utsic.org, I think. All, all the stuff in the past, I think, has primed me for a story like Wardens. I wasn't interested in history as a kid. I, I was very much about the future. I like sci-fi, like things that were happening years from now or what's happening now, where we're going. I kind of thought history was like living in the past, you know, but the more I got into history, you realize that the issues that people were facing in the past are like basically the same issues we're facing now. I mean, there's some superficial differences, but it's basically the same. Every time I hear in the news media about anything that's like a superlative or like politics is way worse now than it used to be. It's just like, you don't know anything about politics. Like it was terrible. People are more divided. It's like, no, like people were more divided. There are huge things that happened that 
just one or two generations ago, people tend to forget about, which is something that I feel is important to bring up and focus on in historical fiction, especially if you can find a way to link what was happening then or the issues that they're facing with what's happening now. Writing a story about a Jewish seamstress who can't afford to live where she's living, even though she's living in a poorer neighborhood, she's trying to save up some money to like get her own place. And she's working these long hours for like at a terrible job. That's a universal story that can pretty much be told any time. You know, the details of it are like set in 1926, but like, man, like that's today. That's every time. It's one thing I found in history. There's sort of two rules I made for myself about thinking about the past. One is that don't assume that everything's different because a lot of the times people are kind of the same and a lot of the stuff is very similar. And the other is don't assume everything's the same because in fact, people did have different cultural values and lived in different places with different specific things they were dealing with and thought differently about stuff. So it's trying to find out where things are different and where they're the same that makes things so interesting. And especially about the Jewish culture and comedy and comics and everything like that, that I I think a lot of people just pass over. Mm -hmm. We know Mel Brooks and we know the DC and Marvel comic creators. The culture itself is just so glossed over that it's it's. It's ridiculous because I, I I know nothing about the Jewish culture. I know nothing about Yiddish or Judaism or anything yeah. like that in, in a comic context or in a life context. And so if you can explain it and if you could talk about it and as you're linking back to your comic as well throughout our conversation, I think it's something that it's, it's necessary and giving a, a wonderful in-depth approach to it. And, and I, I appreciate that knowledge. And I'm sure people who watch this will appreciate it as well. So, Oh, thanks. Uh, if I can just just freestyle on that for a second. One thing that is very apparent when looking at the history of comics, the history of Jewish comics, is that most of the comic writers or the early comic creators were Jewish. The first comic book published in the 30s was published by a Jewish publisher. The first superhero, of course, Superman, two Jewish creators, one from Toronto, Batman, like all, all these guys, Marvel, Stan Lee, Jack Kirby, So for the back of the comic, I have a little essay talking about, it's called Jews in Comics, you know, finally. And it's like, wait, what? Like, it's like, although Jewish people have been involved in comics for many years, and I think I identify 90 Jewish comic authors that I can think of, most people don't write stories about Jews. And I think a lot of that was because people at the time writing comics for a mainstream audience, not going to write about their small, ethnically specific background. They want to write stories about, you know, what people want to read. So, you know, when you're making Captain America, is he going to be like a Jewish character or is he going to be this like blonde haired, blue eyed, all American male? Well, if you're creating a character in the 40s, like you do not create a Jewish character if you want to sell comic books. Like no one's buying that. No one wants to read that. And most people at the time were happy to write stories that were Jewish culturally in some way. The Thing, of course, is a very culturally Jewish character from the way that he sort of talks. But he wasn't officially a Jewish character until like 2006 or something like that. Like officially, like it took, you know, 40 years, 45 years for The Thing, who's like ideally the most Jewish comic character to be Jewish. Spider-Man, Spider-Man is a classic Jewish character in the sense that he can't win, which is an essence of Jewish comedy. And I think deeply rooted in sort of Judaism, the cultural experience of Judaism, where like, even if you win, you'll lose. You know, it's always like one step forward, two steps back. That's sort of like the general cultural feeling born throughout, you know, centuries of historical repression. Every time you get some advancement, there's something that sort of, you know, puts you and and your people back. Uh, And Spider-Man, I think, is a classic example of that, where when he wins, he loses. Every victory he has as Spider-Man comes at a cost to Peter Parker which is something that you find a lot in sort of typical Jewish comedy. Uh, Usually, you know, the big happy ending where everything is great. That's not usually how they end, or at least it's, you know, sometimes it's how, but it's not. There's usually a tinge of sadness, a tinge of failure to it, a tinge of the cost. I think Stan Lee was writing and drawing on that sort of that style, cultural background, the tropes of that. But Spider-Man is not a Jewish character, not officially. He's probably Anglican. He goes to church, you get married in church. He's not. Jewish, because no one's writing Jewish characters because they won't sell, especially in the time the comics are starting in the 30s and 40s, like pervasive anti-Semitism. Like Jews were seen as these weird people who were not like the rest of us. That's the idea. Most of Europe was Christian. Most of America was Christian. Jews were seen as this strange religious minority that just kind of did their own thing. We don't really get it. They're still doing it. So we don't know why. 
And that's not the kind of story, that's not the, the people that you base your stories on if you want to reach an actual audience selling a book. At the time, especially the comic writers were very, very intent on having people buy their books. This was a thing they did for money because that was the only thing they kind of could do. You know, like Jack Kirby could draw, Stanley could write. They weren't even like proud of the fact that they were like comic writers. It wasn't a glamorous, fancy thing like it is now. So the history has, has changed quite a bit in terms of that. There are a few comics that deal with Jewish subjects. Like I mentioned, Will Eisner, of course, A Contract with God. But I mean, when he was doing The Spirit, The Spirit wasn't at least officially Jewish. Like that wasn't a thing that people did to sell things in a popular medium. That was kind of a thing they could reflect on years later. You know, when he wrote A Contract with God, he was already like decades into his career. and He wasn't looking to like make a popular story. He was looking to write a personal story. That's one reason why it is so good. There's other instances of Jewish comics, of course. There's our Spiegelman's Mouse, which everybody knows. The Rabbi's Cat, which I would strongly recommend, which is written by a French author. It takes place around, I think, also in the 20s. I believe it's Tunisia. Tunisia or Algeria? I think it's Tunisia. So it's totally different. It's not Eastern European Jewish. It's North African, probably ethnically more Arabic or closer to uh, Berbers than it is to, uh, you know, sort of like white Europeans. But there's not a lot of stories that focus on Jewish characters specifically. So one of the reasons I'm writing this is just to fill this gap. I mean, I'm not angry about it. I don't come at this from a point of like, ah, why is there not more Jewish representation? Everyone tells the stories they want to tell and they work in the particular, you know, economic and cultural climates that they're working in. Uh, I just happen to be in a place that I have this idea for a story and yet there's nothing like it in terms of the setting or in terms of the culture that's expressed in it. So I'm trying to do something that's new. And not from a an angry, it's about damn time perspective, but from a, this is the story I want to tell, and I don't think anyone else has done it. What has been the most challenging aspect of bringing wardens to life, and how did you overcome it? Well, writing the story was the easiest part. And I don't mean like writing the finished product, which was difficult because editing is hard. Getting the basic idea for it just kind of came organically. Interestingly, I think the origins for Wardens, the first time I came up with anything like it was, I don't know, probably 2017, 2018, something like that, where I was reading Gotham by Gaslight, Victorian Batman story. And I got the idea of putting like Ragman in that story because I was like, wouldn't it be cool if there was like a Victorian Ragman. For some reason, I, I latched onto that. And I was like, well, he's Ragman. It's probably going to be a Jewish character since he's maybe working in the garment trade. And I think Ragman also was Jewish, at least in some incarnations of the character. It just sort of slowly built from that. By the time I started writing it, I had a pretty good idea of where I want to take the characters, what the characters were, what their main motivations were. That wasn't hard. Not to say it's not hard for other people to do stuff or it wouldn't be hard for me to do other stories, but for some reason that just kind of came. Like It felt like the story wrote itself. The hardest part was finding a way to make it. <laughs> really finding an artist was difficult. That took months. Eventually the fact that I found Rob is great, but it's like, it was feeling pretty hopeless for a while when I was looking at people because someone would express interest in their work wasn't that good or it wasn't the right style or someone would say, yeah, I'm interested in this. And they're like, great, it's a 44 page comic and it's going to be an ongoing series. People were like, well, that's nuts. Like, I don't want to commit myself to like six years of like writing like 264 pages of this story. Like a lot of people are not in for something that's as long. So finding the team, specifically the artist, was a challenge. After that, a lot of the challenges in comics are, as a writer at least, is understanding how to work with the artist at first, because uh, sometimes the artist is like, I'm doing this. And you're like, no, that's not what I want. And then the artist explains to you what they're doing. You're like, oh, that's better. And sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's like, that's not what I want. And, and here's why. You're just misreading the scene. Uh, the person's not you know, excited. They're afraid or whatever it is. And understanding where your responsibility as a writer and I guess editor and comic creator, like, you know, putting the whole thing out, like how that works with respecting the artist as an individual with their own artistic vision, because you're hiring the artist to bring themselves. They're not just like a means of making your thing a reality, but it's really, it's a collaboration and you have to find how to work with someone and, and where you can trust them. And I wouldn't say that's the hardest thing, but that took time. Like first few pages, like you're constantly second guessing. You're like, is this right? Does this guy know what's going on? But by like, you know, page 30, you're like, okay, we're on the same page. We've been doing this for like 30 pages already. Like I can trust this person that in their rough, that that's going to be good. And <laughs> kicking myself and trying to decide like where to push back on historical accuracy and where not to. There's actually a funny, uh, funny anecdote of one time 
He was drawing a scene. It's, it's a back alley in the ward. It's supposed to be like a slummy place, even for the slums. You know, Rachel's knocking on this door that says night clinic. She doesn't know what's behind it. Her boyfriend told her to check it out, but she's like, what is this place? And my artist drew the sketches and there was a guy who looks like he's doing this against the wall. And I was like, okay. Uh, so I researched, cause I'm insane. I researched the history of like this. And I was like, I think it was like this. And I was like, actually, you might want to make it more, more like this. Cause I think that's more historically appropriate for a time, a sign that people would have used. And he's like, his hands just propped up against the wall, man. He's taking a pee. And I was like, oh, okay. Like, you know, so there's a lot of like checking myself even to realize like what is happening and like, what is an issue and what's not. I'm a real historical pendant for some stuff. Like I don't use words that don't exist at the time. So for example, people had boyfriends in the 20s but they did not date. The idea of dating comes from the 40s, just the term to date someone. So every single term I use, it's like me looking it up and being like, is this historically accurate? Or is there a better historically accurate way of doing that? Like you can spend forever doing that. And the challenge is, is deciding when to put in the effort to make it better because you want historical accuracy. And when you're just doing this as a way of like avoiding writing the scene or like, it's like you spent an hour on researching this term, just don't use the term if that's going to drive you crazy. Unless someone's playing Scrabble and they're using your book as a backdrop for the words they need to pick. <laughs> no, see, yeah. it's, it's in this book. It's accurate. He's a historian. He knows what he's talking about. Exactly. Yeah. He said it in the 20s because he wrote it. The characters in Wardens represent a tapestry of cultures. How do you approach ensuring accurate and respectful representation while keeping the story engaging? So one thing I really want to do in Wardens is focus on a small number of cultural groups, uh, specifically the Ashkenazi Jewish population of the ward, the Chinese community, which is two streets over from where the, the synagogue, at least a lot of the stuff happens. So very close proximity, but not a lot of intercultural connections. Uh, Black community of the ward as well, which I mentioned is a uh, even an older community than than all the others. To a lesser degree, uh, Italian, that comes up a few issues down. There's others. For me, it was very important to write a story that is not superficial. I don't want to just have like, this is the Chinese person and they do the Chinese thing. No, this is a story that has Chinese people and they engage in different activities that are representative of both their individual culture, where they come from, their historical culture, and the culture of the place they're living in. So for example, in, in issue two, there's a uh, Chinese restaurant called the Lucky Dragon, and we get to meet, so Sonny is a main character in issue one. We don't really see much more about him. We know that he works as a porter in factory. We know that he's dating Goldie. We get to know him a bit, but we don't know his people, his community. And so in issue two, it opens that up a bit where it's like, we're not just focusing on the one guy, we're focusing on other people. And the same thing happens with Nick, who's the uh, trombonist. We see him a bit in issue one, but he becomes a major character and his family's got their own stuff going on. His community's got their own issues and they're not the same. I mean, there are overlaps, of course, in terms of they're all living in like the poor part of Toronto. So they have different interpersonal relations with their communities, different goals, different values in many cases. And so what I want to do is write a story that is anti-tokenistic. I don't want a story where you have like the this, the that, the this, a story where you have people that relate to their own communities. You have multiple characters from that ethnic or cultural background, something that touches on like those histories in an interesting way, in a meaningful way, in a way that's unique to that culture, and then find a way through the plot and which sort of forces people to come together and have the interesting cultural dynamics of having people from different backgrounds who, you know, kind of grew up in the same place, but they're not really from the same culture uh, to see how they operate. If I can toot my own horn for a moment, I do think that's the strength of Wardens over some other stories. I'm really, <laughs> really trying to get a good cultural representation. It's not just that. I mean, it's a character driven story. Uh, practically in terms of uh, representing uh, people from various cultures, I you know, I don't really have too much research aside from my own research, like for all the Jewish stuff. Uh, my wife is Chinese Canadian. I spoke a lot with her family about some of these things in terms of, of everything from names to phrases or specific things that people would do. Worked with a black sensitivity reader for uh, some of that stuff. And I'm sure there's going to be even 
more of that as we go along, not just sensitivity reader, but there's a historian in particular who I need to uh, reach out to for issue three as that stuff becomes important. I'll keep that in my back pocket. We'll get to that in a couple of years. But just doing the work, finding a way to make the cultural specificity a part of the character's identity and not just a thing you throw in there and be like, look, I know a thing, you know, like it has to be meaningful in some way. As you prepare to launch Wardens on Kickstarter, what strategies and lessons from your previous experiences do you plan on leveraging to ensure a successful campaign? And when does it start and end as well? Because we haven't talked about it yet. <laughs> yeah. So I'll start with that. The campaign begins January 17th. It ends on February 9th. So 23 days, not super long, uh, but not super short either. I don't want to have this thing being a thing that just sort of drags on. Kickstarter campaigns are notorious for having a sort of slow middle period. I want to start strong and end strong. That's the goal. From previous campaigns, one thing I learned is that you want to have as much press before uh, or at the beginning, because the two strongest and most active part of a Kickstarter campaign is the beginning and the end. So you want people ready to go before the campaign starts. I've been sending out things on my mailing list. I've been putting some stuff up on my social media and we'll be doing a bit more as we get closer to the date. I wish I knew how to run a Kickstarter campaign that was less like this amazing campaign that can do everything well. What I've been trying to do for this is reach into different communities than before. For Awakening, it was largely the indie comic community. But with Wardens, I realized the people who will be interested are probably indie comic creators and probably also Jewish community. So I reached out to a lot of places in Toronto, uh, various synagogues or Jewish uh, organizations, and I've been speaking with some of them. I'm actually going to speak tomorrow at, uh, there's a synagogue in Kensington Market. I think a Jewish writers Toronto were putting out an anthology of stories. The guy said, hey, why don't you come along and talk about your thing as well? And I was like, oh, it's perfect, you know, so email a bunch of people. Sometimes they'll email back. I mean, because it is so sort of, you know, culturally specific and Jewish focused, but not exclusively Jewish, there's a bit of a natural community that you can talk to about it which helps, but also, you know, I don't just want it to be like, you know, like a Jewish guy writing stories for other Jewish people. Like I do want this to have a broader cultural resonance. It's trying to find out how to do that, which has been a learning process. I'm sure will continue to be a learning process. So here's the Kickstarter campaign. We'll go through some of the words. First and foremost, we've got the digital comic itself and the physical comic. Of course, that's the biggest reward. I hope people actually get that and read it. There's another tier of rewards. Uh, that includes five trading cards and uh, two postcards. If you scroll down a little bit more, you'll uh, you'll get there. There's a whole big thing that says rewards. <laughs> there's some preview pages. I've got lots of stuff here on the Kickstarter. So like, <laughs> there's certainly not for lack of content. Uh, so yeah, five trading cards. Uh, what I did with my last campaign, Awakening, is I made trading cards because I, I just like cards. Uh, they've got a little character bios on the back and some stuff that's a little different and not in the comics. So that's fun. Uh, extra content, I figure, is always good. Two postcards. Those are based off images from the comic itself. And putting a nice standard postcard template so you can actually send them if you know how to send a postcard because mail is now a thing that people might have to learn. I've got this Mario and 3 inspired art print. That's going to be an 8 by 10 art print inspired by a drawing of the booklet art from Mario 3. It's got so many characters. I love my artist. Our next tier we're having, uh, you can have original character designs done by my artist. So that's me, uh, our editor and the artist, uh, the designs he did for us. I think people will probably have a lot of fun with this. If you're looking for some original art, like a caricature, doing it in a sort of a 1920s style to fit with the series. And the final reward is going to be a draw-in for issue two. So if you want to be a part of Warden's Issue 2, have yourself as a character in there, that's going to be the highest tier. That also includes original character art. So what my hope is that people want to have an original piece of character art for themselves, and then we can use that character and then plop them into Issue 2. And I know exactly where everyone's going because I have lots of fun scenes in mind for people to be in. Yeah, there's more than enough information on this Kickstarter campaign to answer hopefully any of your questions, like what is the ward or <laughs> when is this shipping? Uh, my goal is to have this ship pretty soon after the campaign ends. Uh, I hope that everyone gets their books by May, June at the latest. I don't like keeping projects lingering forever. The book is currently almost done. Uh, there's 40 pages of art have been completed and lettered, like fully finalized. We're just working on the last four pages, which will be done during the campaign. And I've done the front matter, the back matter, the cover, the back cover, like all of that is required is getting those last pages in, doing once over, and then sending to the printer. 
I'm printing locally. There's a printer I use here in Toronto. I just go to the place and get the stuff and I'll just ship everything out from my house. Again, local fulfillment. We're doing this on a shoestring. Printing company is called Blitz. I think they're on Richmond Street towards uh, in the east. Uh, I used them for Awakening and I was very happy with them. We, we have a bit of a relationship at this point, which makes things even better. Well, Ari, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming back on the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's been great chatting with you. And everyone, check out Wardens. If you're looking for something that's fun, if you're looking for something that's a different story than probably any other story you've read, something that's a little culturally specific, upbeat, while still dealing with all the deep character emotions and, and wackiness, all the supernatural stuff that gets thrown into it. Uh, Wardens is your jam. I mean, it's my jam and I hope it's yours too. So where can we find it? How can we support you? Everything like that. You can check Wardens out on Kickstarter. Wardens number one, I think it's called like Wardens, a supernatural action comic series. Uh, check it out on Kickstarter, support it. Campaign runs from the 17th, uh, January 17th to February 9th. We're doing an early bird for a few of the tiers. So get in early and you'll save a couple of bucks. Back it. Enjoy. Nice. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You could, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others quite literally on our website, tgtmedia.com or Two Geeks Talking. That's T-W-O. Website's going through a revamp, as it always is. So go to our YouTube channel because that's a lot more updated. YouTube.com forward slash TGT Media. The podcast is back at twogeekstalking.podbean.com or just search Two Geeks Talking wherever you get your podcasts. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.